Do you believe in UFOs? Do you believe in alien abductions? Have you ever heard of an alien abduction case where there were multiple witnesses who didn't know the abductee? Well, I'm going to tell you about one of those cases on this episode of Peculiar Finds for Curious Minds, and I'm Jennifer Kennedy. Don't forget to check out my website, PeculiarTalk.com, where you'll find my psychic services that I offer, including psychic readings with tarot readings, oracle readings, and rune readings, as well as psychic services for the police, paranormal teams, and more. You can also find every episode on the website, and you can subscribe to it on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podomatic, and YouTube. On this episode, I'm going to tell you about the abduction of Linda Napolitano, also known as Linda Cortile. This is one of the best documented UFO abductions in the history of abductions because it has multiple witnesses who did not know the abductee. There's been other cases where there are witnesses who knew the abductee or where people were abducted together, multiple people. But this is one of the best, well-documented cases where there were multiple people who had never even met the woman who was abducted. Again, her name was Linda Napolitano, also known as Linda Cortile. It happened on November 30th in 1989 in Manhattan, New York. Linda was 41 years old at the time. It's dubbed the Brooklyn Bridge Abduction. She was abducted from her apartment through a closed window at 3 a.m. in the morning into a UFO with gray aliens and subjected to medical procedures. She suffered a complete loss in memory. She only remembered bits and pieces, but through regressive hypnosis, she recalled being taken, the room she was examined in, and several other things very vividly. And there are many eyewitnesses who had never met her who collaborated her story. So let me tell you about the actual abduction before I get into the whole story because there's a lot of weird, crazy things in this story. The initial abduction kind of went like this. Linda was laying in her bed in her 12th floor apartment, getting ready to go to sleep when she felt a weird presence in her room, like someone standing in your room. Kind of like in haunting cases. You just feel something weird in your room. And then she felt sort of like a slow paralysis coming on, creeping up her legs. Basically, her legs went numb. And then she saw five short, black-eyed figures with large heads, which she later described as looking like a typical gray alien. They were all standing around her bed, just staring at her. She threw a pillow at one of them, and then her arms became paralyzed, too, after she threw the pillow. She tried to call out to her husband, but she couldn't move and she couldn't scream. The aliens then picked her up and took her to her living room, where a really bright, whitish-blue light shone through the window of her living room. She was then levitated off the floor into the air in the living room, in the fetal position, and then floated out through the closed window, floated right through the glass as though it didn't even exist. She was accompanied by three of the five aliens. They floated out too. She floated out the window and she's floating in mid air, 12 stories up. She stood up from the fetal position to a standing position in mid air as though she were standing on something. She stood up in mid air and looked up where she saw a spacecraft that opened up like a clam. And then she and the three aliens that were with her floated up inside of it. The craft then rapidly sped downward into the East River near Pier 17, down into the water, under the water. The other two aliens stayed behind in her apartment. While on the spacecraft, 
she was floated down, still levitating, floated down several hallways with a lot of benches, sort of like our own benches, and through several sets of sliding doors. She was then brought into a room where she saw many lights and buttons all over the room and then eventually taken to another room and placed on a large table. She realized at that point that she was in some sort of medical examination room and she became really scared. She screamed and yelled and shouted and one of the aliens said something in a language that she couldn't understand and he covered her mouth with his hand or she it covered her mouth with its hand. She believed that it was trying to tell her to be quiet. I mean, obviously, because it's covering her mouth. Several aliens surrounded her on this table and performed an examination and operation on her, including on her nose. In Linda's own words, here's how she described parts of the abduction. Quote, I'm standing up on nothing, and they take me out all the way up, way above the building. Oh, I hope I don't fall. The UFO opens up almost like a clam and then I'm inside. I see benches similar to regular benches and they're bringing me down a hallway. Doors open like sliding doors. Inside are all these lights and buttons and a big long table. I don't want to get up on that table. They get me on the table anyway. They start saying things to me and I'm yelling. I can still yell. One of them says something that sounds like Nobyeg. I think they were trying to tell me to be quiet because he put his hand over my mouth. So that's how she described it. When she was returned to her apartment, she couldn't wake her kids or her husband up. She described it as if they were turned off. She thought they weren't breathing. So she went and she got a mirror and she held the mirror up underneath her husband and children's noses to make sure they were still breathing and fortunately they were they were just they, they couldn't be roused they couldn't be woken up like i said she described it as if they were turned off not long after this linda noticed a bump sort of on the side of her nose and she started to complain to her doctor about it her doctor looked at it and said that it was a scar from a nasal surgery and she thought well that's weird she told her doctor that she'd never had a nasal surgery so she shouldn't have a scar there so the doctor took an x-ray of her nose and the x-ray revealed a non-natural object of unknown material that looked like a small shank with two curly wires on it and there is a picture of the x-ray that can be found online I, it's hard to find. I came across it. It's just a little tiny thing with two little tiny curly wires on it. Shortly after the x-rays were taken, now some reports say that it was the next day and there's other reports that say it was a few weeks later, but sometime after, not long after she got the x-ray, she one day got a very, very severe nosebleed. She was afraid that it had to do with the implant that they had found in her nose, so she went back to the doctor to have another x-ray done. And when they did these x-rays, they showed that the object was gone, that it was no longer in her nose. But there was a buildup of cartilage that indicated that there was something implanted there previously. So there was signs that it had been there before. She believed that the aliens had abducted her again and removed it because of the x-ray happening, but she didn't have any memory of that. After the x-rays and the doctor visit, she had been reading a book by Bud Hopkins, who is a well-respected and leading ufologist. He was one of the, the leading people in the UFO and abduction study field. She contacted him after reading one of his books and finding similarities between a case of another woman that he wrote about in the book and her own experience. So she wrote a letter to him and they got in touch and he began researching her case and he, he stuck by her case for several years. He's also the one that put her through regressive hypnosis. One year after her abduction, two men wrote letters to Hopkins saying that they witnessed the abduction. These men are known as Richard and Dan. They were, it turns out, 
CIA security guards for a senior United Nations statesman named Javier Perez de Cuellar. They were all visiting Manhattan at the time of the abduction. Now Hopkins was very skeptical at first, but they became pertinent to the case. He did not tell them anything that Linda had told him. And they did not know Linda. He kept all the details private secret from them and just listened to their story, or I guess read it because they wrote him letters. And they described the abduction exactly as Linda had described it. And again, they had never met her. In Richard's own words, he said, quote, There was an oval-shaped object hovering over the top of the apartment building, two or three blocks up from where we sat. See, they were sitting on the ground in a car. We didn't know where it came from. It happened too fast. Its lights turned from a bright reddish orange to a whitish blue coming out of the bottom. Green lights rotated round the edge of the saucer. A little girl or woman wearing a white gown sailed out of the window in a fetal position and then stood in midair in this beam of light. I could see three of the ugliest creatures I ever saw. I don't know what they were. They weren't human. Their heads were out of proportion. Very large heads with no hair. Those buggers were escorting her into the craft. My partner screamed, We've got to get them! We tried to get out of the car, but couldn't. After the woman was escorted in, the oval turned reddish-orange again and whisked off. So again, those were Richard's words. They both said that they saw a woman and three small beings float through the air to a massive hovering craft. Hopkins told them that the woman that they saw was Linda Cortile, but kept details private until later on when they had told their story and he knew that he could trust them. It had such an impact on the security guards that over the years they basically went psychotic. One of them came to believe that Linda had some special power and influence over the others because of the abduction, and he began to stalk her. On April 29th of 1991, they kidnapped Linda. Richard forced her into the back seat of the car in broad daylight, and Dan drove the car around for three hours while they interrogated her about the abduction. Dan got really upset when she kept saying that she had no idea why she was abducted, and he even accused her of being an alien herself. They forced her to take off her shoes so that they could see her feet in order to prove that she wasn't an alien. And once Dan saw that she had human feet, they took her back to her apartment and let her go. I know this sounds crazy. These are CIA agents, but they kidnapped this woman, as the story goes. When they returned her to her apartment, she immediately called Hopkins and told him what happened. A few days later, Hopkins took her through regressive hypnosis where she recalled the license plate of the Mercedes that she was kidnapped in and the plate of a Rolls Royce that was parked in front of it when they initially pushed her into the car. Hopkins contacted police and police confirmed that both plate numbers were diplomatic plates connected to the United Nations. So all these pieces are fitting together to be legit. Richard and Dan had both thought that she helped plan the abduction with the aliens, that she was in on it. In letters that they wrote to Hopkins, they said that a few days after the abduction, they regained more memories. And this is what they said that they remembered. After the ship dove down into the river, they saw the aliens and Linda on the shore digging in the sand with small shovels and square buckets. They walked down to them, and Linda pulled a dead fish out of the water. She walked up to them, held the fish out, and said, look what you have done. They asked what she meant, but she didn't say anything else. An alien spoke for her and said, Lady of the Sands. The aliens had no toes. Linda and the aliens walked away, and then the three men wound up back in their car. Now, whenever Linda would tell Hopkins any details, whether it be during regressive hypnosis or just regular talking, he never shared these details with Richard or Dan. And whenever Richard or Dan would tell Hopkins any details, he never shared them with Linda. So he's getting these stories from both sides and then he's seeing 
how well they match and it, it's turning out that they match exactly so after getting these stories about the beach and the digging in the sand and everything hopkins performed regressive hypnosis on linda yet again and this time she recalled that she was on the shore digging for samples with the aliens and she said that she had done this with them before she said that they were trying to discover if there were minerals in the sand that could have caused the death of many of our aquatic creatures she remembered meeting the men on the beach and holding the fish and saying look what you have done to them she recalled the aliens referring to her as lady of the sands but she didn't know what that meant she said these exact things during her regressive hypnosis session but hopkins never told her any of this he never told her any of these details so she said the exact same thing that richard and dan had told him so you know it's kind of getting crazy here but it gets even crazier dan later on kidnapped her again on his own and took her to a deserted beach house on long island he thought she was a threat to humanity working with the aliens so he kidnapped her and he took her to this deserted beach house on long island and you know we're not quite sure what he was trying to accomplish but he forced her to wear a nightgown similar to the one she wore during the abduction you know, he we know that he was trying to get answers linda managed to escape but she didn't get very far before dan cut up to her on the beach he tried to drown her in the ocean but richard showed up and he stopped dan and he talked him into letting her go richard took her back to her apartment and told her that something had to be done about dan that he was getting a little psychotic so shortly after this incident dan was placed into a psychiatric hospital due to his psychotic behavior a week after the second kidnapping richard sent hopkins another letter which apologized for dan's behavior and gave more info about the abduction and on a side note hopkins wrote a book about this abduction and a lot of this information is included in the book and a lot of the information about the abduction he got directly from richard and dan and linda and several other people back to the information richard sent him a letter apologized for dan's behavior and gave him more info about the abduction and here's what he told him he said that the night of the abduction, when they saw Linda and the aliens on the beach, there were two other cars with them, but after the incident on the beach, those two cars disappeared without a trace. He said that Linda spoke to them telepathically on the beach, that when she told them, look what you have done, she didn't speak using her mouth, she spoke telepathically. He said that when they kidnapped her the first time, she communicated telepathically to them saying be kind don't hurt me and when this telepathic be kind don't hurt me communication happened dan became very upset and tried to jump out of the car and drag her around to the front of the car but he wasn't able to move his arms in order to drag her his arms basically became paralyzed these are the things that basically led to dan's mental demise but Linda had no recollection of any sort of telepathy abilities or actions or anything. As far as she knew, it never happened. Later on in 1991, Richard actually met up with Linda. They met up and hung out, and he confessed to her that he was in love with her. She didn't know how to respond because on the one side, she was happily married, and on the other side, she had actually developed feelings for him after he saved her from Dan, when Dan had kidnapped her. But it turns out that they may have been connected in some weird, strange way, beyond just this initial him being a witness to her abduction. And here's where we're going to dive pretty deep into the rabbit hole. Richard had told Hopkins in one of his letters about a recurring dream he had had from the age of 10 until he was 25 years old. It was a recurring dream, and he said that in this dream, he was in a room of bright white light with a girl about three years younger than him. He referred to her as Baby Anne, and she referred to him as Mickey. Neither of them could recall their real names, so that they kind of made up these names for each other. He said that in the dream, Baby Anne was always escorted into and out of the room by emotionless men. 
They would play together in the dreams, but years later they became romantic in them. In his last dream about her, they both begged the emotionless men to allow them to stay together, but the men refused. Richard became an emotional mess over the last few years of those last dreams because he had basically fallen in love with baby Anne, which he thought was just a figment of his imagination because she's only in dreams. When he witnessed Linda's abduction, he realized that she was actually baby Anne. He saw her on the beach and everything. He recognized her. She was baby Anne from his dreams. Now, Hopkins had this information, but he didn't give any of these details to Linda at all. He asked her if she had had any recurring dreams with certain people or if there was any kind of weird people from her past. And that's all. That's as far as he took the question. He asked her if any of these things happened when she was younger. He did not tell her anything about Richard's dreams. And when he asked her this, Linda recalled very vividly recurring dreams about Mickey that were identical to Richard's. And she even noted how similar to Mickey and her own son, Johnny, that Richard looked. And I think what they were implying here is that Johnny might have been actually Richard's son. I'm not too sure. But supposedly, there, she said that Richard looked similar to her son, Johnny, and that he looked similar to Mickey. And again, Hopkins performed regressive hypnosis on her to see if she could recall any more memories or details pertaining to Mickey. So when he did these regressive hypnosis sessions, she recalled that when she was younger, she was in a changing room at a public pool when two blonde men in diving suits took her, came into the changing room, picked her up and took her. As they carried her out of the changing room, they carried her through the pool area. She said that it looked like everything in the pool area was frozen in time. So they took her through the pool area, took her outside and she saw a spaceship hover up above, and then they all floated up into the spaceship, the two blonde men and herself. The men led her into a featureless room that was brightly lit up with white light. This is when and where she was introduced to Mickey. Her and Mickey spent time together at this introduction and got to know each other. Then Linda was brought back to the pool changing area and everything was back to normal. It was no longer frozen. Everything was back to normal. So basically she's describing an abduction incident where she met Mickey. And then for years after that, she had recurring dreams where she would play with Mickey and talk to Mickey and become romantically involved with Mickey all the time being in this brightly lit room, bright white lit up room. And Richard is describing the exact same thing in recurring dreams. And neither of them knew that each other had these, rec these recurring dreams or anything. Well, shortly after all of this discovery, this is when Javier, the diplomat, this is when he mailed Hopkins a letter claiming that he also witnessed the abduction. Of course he did. You know, the Dan and Richard, the CIA bodyguards to this guy, were there with him in New York. So, it, of course, he witnessed it, too. Well, he finally wrote a letter, told Hopkins that he witnessed the abduction, and that he was pretty shaken by it. He agreed to speak with Hopkins, but he insisted on being kept anonymous. He said that he would deny it if it, it ever came out that he spoke to Hopkins. Well, I mean, obviously it's out now. I wonder if he denied it. So, anyway, not long after Javier contacted Hopkins... Linda also received a letter from Dan, and in this letter, he was saying that she was a half-breed alien and that he was going to escape the psychiatric ward, take her to a foreign country, and marry her so they could be together for the rest of their lives. Now, he actually did manage to escape the psychiatric hospital, and he got some of his friends at the CIA to help him with his plan to try and go and marry Linda. Richard found out about it and he got some of his friends from the CIA to help him stop Dan. So they stopped Dan and then Dan seems to have completely disappeared after this. He's never been heard from again. Nobody knows what happened to Dan. 
Well, by now, Linda's case had become pretty publicly known, pretty well known, not just basically public, pretty well known across the country. And this is when more witnesses came forward. Hopkins always kept details private whenever he spoke to witnesses. He always kept it private, just like he did with the CIA guards, in order to better corroborate their stories with Linda's stories and Dan and Richard's stories. One of those witnesses was Janet Kimball. She was a retired telephone operator who was driving on the Brooklyn Bridge at the time of the abduction. She said that all of a sudden, all the lights went out. All the lamp posts and everything on the bridge, everything just went dark and traffic came to an immediate stop. All the cars were stopped on the bridge. People were getting out of their cars, trying to figure out what's going on. She got out of her car and looked up and saw a woman beamed out of her apartment and up into a spacecraft. She and others on the bridge all thought that they were watching a movie filming for some crazy sci-fi movie. They didn't know that it was real until way later when the case became public and they're like oh my gosh i saw that i thought it was a movie but it's not this was actually real so then that's why janet came forward to hopkins another witness that had come forward was a new york truck driver who remains unnamed we can't find his name but he came forward and said that he witnessed it as well there were claims that traffic had stopped and created a traffic jam downtown. There was a witness who saw the traffic jam. Linda said this about that. Quote, At the New York Post complex, a well-known journalist leaves a nearby bar. Too drunk to drive, he asks one of the drivers if he can drop him home. The driver answers that the lorries cannot move because there are several limos blocking the street. He even suspected that the big boss could be paying a visit to the newspaper. So that's not a witness to the abduction itself, but it was just a witness talking about how traffic was jammed up. And the limos are the limos to the diplomat, Richard and Dan and Javier. So we have witnesses placing them on the scene as well. There were several witnesses that saw the diplomat and his guards in the area and in the limos. There was a total of 25 witnesses that came forward over a period of three decades whose stories were all able to be verified as matching the other witness stories and Linda's story and Richard and Dan's stories, even though none of these people had ever met before. 25 witnesses none of them had ever met each other none of them even knew that each other had come forward hopkins didn't tell them oh yeah we've had 10 other people come forward and say the same thing no he took each of these people's story without saying anything to them about anybody else corroborating it he just basically was a listener or he asked them questions and that's it so we have 25 witnesses of this abduction and their stories match each other's they all describe the exact same thing a woman in a white nightgown in a fetal position floating out a window a closed window at that through a bright bluish white light beam and up into a spacecraft and that the spacecraft zipped away and down into the river so all of these 25 witnesses stories match each other's they match Linda's story, they match Richard's story, they match Dan's story, they match Javier's story. They all describe the same thing. That is unheard of in UFO abduction cases. You never see witnesses. But then again, I mean, we are talking about Manhattan, New York. How can anything in New York not be witnessed? Especially if you're floating out a 12-story apartment building into a spacecraft. So yeah, this, this makes this the most credible documented abduction story out there. There's not a lot of information about the actual abduction itself other than what I've told you. And supposedly Linda had been abducted multiple times in the past and all this has come about through her regressive hypnosis sessions. But over the years since the abduction, she's, she always stayed in touch with Hopkins 
and they always talked about any other new experiences she had or anything like that. And over the years, not only did she experience a, uh, more of the abduction type experiences, she also experienced various strange people following her, stalking her. She would see the same people over and over, just following her around, cars following her around. She's even had strange people grabbing her and attempting to kidnap her, grabbing hold of her, trying to yank her away. She, in an interview once, she described an incident where she was with her cousin and some strange man popped up out of nowhere, grabbed her wrist and started to try and drag her off. And her cousin grabbed her around her waist and was pulling the opposite direction. They basically came into a tug of war until she used her other hand, raised it up and started pounding on the guy's head and he finally let her go. But this happened repeatedly. She's been basically followed, stalked and harassed ever since the abduction incident. Now, whether it's from UFO fans or non-believers or government people or who knows, CIA, it's hard to tell, but she's had these incidences throughout the years after the abduction. I tried to find some information about what she's doing today. I couldn't find any information about where she's at now. I don't even know if she's alive still, but there's not really any information. I don't know if she just kind of went under the radar or if she passed away. There's not really anything else out there as far as, as far as what she's doing now. But that's, that's her abduction story. And it goes beyond just the abduction story. I mean, you're talking about a couple of CIA agents who went mental over their whole experience. Because even though they weren't abducted, they still experienced a close encounter. They still came face to face in their memories with these aliens. They still saw everything. So they kind of lost their minds. And, and the thing that makes it even more credible, not just that it has 25 witnesses, but also that a United Nations diplomat came forward as a witness and said, yes, this is what I saw. Someone of his stature typically is not gonna come forward, at least in those days. Maybe nowadays, because we have had government officials from other countries come forward and say, yes, UFOs exist, and we have th this and this and that on record, and so on. But, I mean, we're talking about back in 89, 90, 91, you know, over a period of several years. Granted, he didn't want it to come out that he came forward. It eventually did. But he did come forward. So this is the best documented UFO abduction case out of all the UFO abduction cases out there, simply because it had so many witnesses who did not know Linda, who had never met her and who had never met each other. That's pretty mind boggling. Oh, and by the way, the reason why she's known as both Linda Napolitano and Linda Cortile, initially, I, I can't remember if I told you this earlier, but initially when she contacted Hopkins, she used the alias last name of Cortile. That's never been her last name. It was an alias because she, you know, she was like, am I going crazy? You know, she just kind of made up this alias last name because she didn't want him to know exactly who she was. But later on, she went ahead and came forward with her real last name, Napolitano. She's still known as Linda Cortile. It's still known as the Linda Cortile abduction. But she's also known as her real name, Linda Napolitano. So what do you think? Do you think Linda was actually abducted? Was she making it all up? Are we talking about mass hysteria, mass psychosis? Pretty bizarre. Not just the abduction itself, but all the crazy tales with the CIA agents and everything. Kidnapping her and then the weird recurring dreams. Some pretty bizarre stuff. Do you believe it? Let me know in the comments. Comment on the Podomatic. Comment on the Facebook page. Tell me what you think. That's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we're going to talk about some sort of historic crime case. But I'm not going to tell you what it was. A historic true crime case about a female torturer and serial killer. Check back next week to see who I'm talking about. 
Don't forget to check out my social media at Peculiar Finds on Twitter and Facebook.com slash Peculiar Finds for Curious Minds. And don't forget to subscribe. You can find my podcast, Peculiar Finds for Curious Minds, on Podomatic. That's the host of my podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and YouTube. So make sure you look it up and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening.